Right, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, uh, welcome to our, I think it's our um, eighth webinar in the series of 20, uh, 21 for 21. Um, we're joined this evening by Dan Williams. Um, Dan um, asked me to describe him as a, as a man on a mission. Um, and I have certainly seen a lot about Dan um, over the years uh, with regard to this particular subject. Um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, sight loss um, doesn't need to mean job loss. Um, so Dan um, is in a mission uh, to support people that have uh, low vision and um, he is, himself suffers with uh, retinitis pigmentosa and he's trying to basically make sure that um, the workplace is more inclusive for people with sight problems, not only sight problems but disability in general uh, because he champions uh, the whole disability cause. Um, he's an extremely hardworking young man and um, is uh, definitely 100% dedicated to the cause of sight loss and disability. So on behalf of IOH, the Association of Occupational Health and Wellbeing Professionals, um, I'd like you to welcome uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, the, this evening's um, webinar, Dan Williams. So thank you, Dan. It's over to That's you. Great. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here this evening and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through the webinar so it'll take about 40-45 minutes um, and then what we'll do at the end is we'll take questions so you can either type them or speak them, um, whatever, whatever works for you, whatever you're more comfortable with. Um, what we'll also do at the end as well is if you want to start writing down questions as we're going through um, then obviously feel free to ask questions and I think one of the main things for me is if you don't ask then you're never going to know. Um, and if you, you don't ask, then you assume, and to assume makes an ass out of me and you, and that's not really good either. So it's really important that you, um, you, you don't, you're not afraid to ask at the end, um, and because otherwise you're just going to sit there and, and wonder, but it, I'd rather you not wonder, I'd rather you ask the question. So we'll, without further ado, we'll get on with the, with the um, webinar, and then we'll do questions at the end. So thank you. Meeting controls. PowerPoint slide show site loss need. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So my name is Daniel Williams. I'm the founder of Visualized Training and Consultancy. Um, I'm a qualified rehabilitation assistant for people with visual impairment, and I'm also a qualified eye clinic liaison officer for people with visual impairment. I'm also joined by my colleague, Jill Perry, um, who you may hear in the background. Um, I also have sight loss myself, and I work with organizations across the UK to make services more inclusive for blind and partially sighted people, whether that's customers or employees, by delivering visual impairment awareness training to raise awareness amongst colleagues that are working with visually impaired staff, um, also raising awareness of eye health amongst organizations, and I also do workplace assessments for those people that have visual impairments that are struggling in the workplace and 50, about 50% of people that have a visual impairment will give up their jobs because they think that they can no longer do their job due to their vision, um, just because they're not aware of what is available to help support them in the workplace. So hopefully by the end of today's session, we will all realize and come to the conclusion that sight loss should not equal job loss. Um, and we can empower our employees that have visual impairments with this message. If you got any questions, like Helen said, just ask them at the end. You can also follow us on Twitter at VisualizeTC. Um, and you can also tweet us as we're going through the session. Okay, so I'm going to talk first of all about the main causes of sight loss. So there's four main causes of sight loss, which is congenital, disease, injury, and old age. So I'm going to go through them one by one. So congenital um, blindness can happen during pregnancy. So the mother could drink too much alcohol, um, take too many drugs, could be in a violent relationship during pregnancy and the, the baby or the fetus could be injured. Um, the mother could also come into contact with dog or cat feces during pregnancy. And also the child potentially could come into contact with dog or, or cat feces as well. And so it's really important to try and prevent this. I'm going to go on to diseases now. So common diseases such as multiple sclerosis, diabetes, which we know is on the increase, cancer of the eye, which you can also get, meningitis, measles, mumps and rubella, and autoimmune diseases such as lupus 
um, and that type of thing. So again, some people don't link these type of diseases with vision um, and the, sometimes the primary disease is, is focused on and sometimes people don't link vision. So for example, diabetes, you know, a lot of people are generally aware that you potentially could lose, lose a leg and have that amputated, but some people don't necessarily think that you can also lose vision through that. Um, autoimmune diseases, you know, when they attack certain parts of the body, they can also attack the optic nerve, which could also impact on, on vision loss. So again, it's just making sure that when you're seeing um, patients or employees um, out on the road, that actually try and link, sometimes it can be vision, vision problems as well, and not always to focus on their primary disability. Um, common injuries, so high exposure to sunlight, so people, you know, not wearing sunglasses, if you imagine what the sun can do to your skin over a period of time, um, imagine what, this, what the sun can do to your eyes over a period of time. So making sure that you, your employees wear decent quality sunglasses with, with UV protection, but also that your children are wearing decent quality sunglasses in the sun. Car accidents, so people having car accidents can impact on people's vision. Sports injuries, so not wearing protective gear when doing certain sports. And also DIY accidents, so people not wearing specialist goggles when they're doing certain DIY, maybe getting a nail in the eye, that type of thing. People, you know, um, having reactions to medication also could impact on their vision. Smoking can impact on people's vision. But also the other thing is um, people wearing contact lenses. So a lot of people nowadays wear contact lenses. And some people wear contact lenses in saunas, swimming pools, and in the shower. And you can get bacteria from that by doing that. And it's not advisable to wear those type of things, um, type of contact lenses in, in, in those environments. So removing your contact lenses as well puts you at less risk of getting sight loss later on in life. Okay, so old age, um, people are more prone to get certain conditions when they are older, such as age-related macular degeneration, glaucoma, cataracts. And also more people are more likely when they're older to get strokes. And again, strokes can impact on people's vision. So we only talk about sight loss symptoms, visual impairment, blindness, whatever terminology you want to use. Only 5% of the general pop of, of the population of people that are registered blind see nothing at all. And a lot of people think that people who are blind don't see anything at all. So um, only 5% of people see nothing at all. So people will have common symptoms. So they may have problems with visual acuity. And what we mean by that is that people may struggle to see in the distance. So what someone, for example, at um, 60, uh, someone with 20-20 vision may be able to see at 60 meters. Someone with a visual impairment may only see two meters, three meters, four meters. So it's severely reduced from the general population. Some people also may have problems with contrast sensitivity. So they may have problems if, for example, there's um, a light gray and a dark gray together. And that may blend in for some people as one block of gray. So again, it's just to realize that situation, okay? Some people may also have problems going from a dark room or a dark environment into a light environment. They may have to wait for their eyes to adjust. That may take one minute, two minutes, three minutes. And again, people that have general 20-20 vision, they can adjust to that pretty quickly. People that have a visual impairment may take them a lot longer. Um, some people may struggle with depth perception. So, for example, when you're walking down a step, how deep is that step? Is it one meter, two meters? And people may struggle with that as well. Some people may also have problems with, they may have headaches um, and they may experience severe migraines um, and they may not think that it's linked to their vision. They may just think that they have a headache. Um, and some people most, may also have problems with glare. So, you know, when the sun is really, really bright. And again, most people can adjust to that pretty quickly, but someone that has a visual impairment may take them a lot longer to adjust to that different level in light. Also, people that have a visual impairment may experience what we call Charles Bonnet syndrome. So if you imagine that the, the, the vision isn't seeing the full picture, the brain will start to fill in the missing gap. So if you imagine you're walking along the street and you see a puddle on the floor, and to everybody else, that looks like a puddle. But to some people, they experience Charles Bonnet, where the brain is filling in the missing gaps because it's not seeing the full picture. It may look like a hole in the floor, or it may look like there's lots of spiders on the floor. And some people may think that, you know, they have a severe mental illness and they may see visual hallucinations. They may see children when there's no children there, um, that type of thing. But it's not that they have a severe mental illness. It's that they're experiencing Charles Bonnet because their vision isn't seeing the full picture. And some people also get diagnosed with things like dementia incorrectly because they have a visual impairment and they get visual hallucinations. But actually, it's because they're not seeing the full picture and the brain starts to fill in the missing gap. So again, it's one of those things that 
doesn't get a lot of exposure and a lot of people are not aware of. So as a practitioner, how do you identify sight loss? Which is an interesting situation. Me, sorry to interrupt, but there's a whole lot of background noise going on. They become clumsy. So, for example, I met a lady um, last week. She was diagnosed with a visual impairment at the age of 50, and she'd never been for an eye test before. Um, and she just thought that she was a clumsy person. And her husband just used to tell her all the time that women are clumsy, and, and, that's, what she, and that's what she believed. And for 50 years, she went through life believing that she just thought she was a clumsy woman and, and assumed that was true. She'd never been for an eye test before. And when she got, and she, she continued to drive. And when she used to drive, she always used to drive in the day and she used to drive only, only with her children because that's, she felt a lot more confident driving with her children in the car to sort of help her slightly with some of the visual clues. And, and that was her normal. And she thought that that was the, the normal, you know, normal. And that was her normal vision. Um, when she got to 50, she got diagnosed with, a, with an eye condition and then got told that she's una legally unable to drive. And, but obviously had carried on driving all that time. So it just sort of proves that there are people out there that may just perceive themselves as clumsy, but people are not generally just clumsy. They're clumsy for a reason. So when people say things like I'm clumsy, well, you need to question why, why are you clumsy? Is it because of your vision or is it because of other things? Yeah. So again, some people will tell me, you know, most commonly oh, the computer screen is, is really difficult to, to see. Um, they may be sort of going really close to the screen. And again, it's highlighting why are they going close to the screen and they're not seeing it properly. So some people may, may have problems with eye fatigue and they may think that their eyes are get, getting headaches. So they may have headaches navigating around. They may struggle with navigating. So they're navigating around the office. They may be tripping a lot more. Um, they're falling over. They're having maybe extreme headaches. So they're, but they're putting the headaches down to other, other problems. So it may be that they're putting headaches down to another, another type of condition or a disability of some sort. Other people may sort of find that actually the light in the office is, is causing them severe discomfort. And other people may find that they're having problems with their eyes. So their eyes start itching or they become very red or they become very dry. They, they start feeling a lot more tired than usual. But again, they're not linking this to vision. And these are all symptoms that you potentially could link to vision. But obviously you could link these to other conditions as well. But it's just making sure that you highlight that actually vision can be linked to these, these types of difficulties. Um, people saying that they can no longer yeah. see the print on the, on the paper or they're struggling to see the print. And again, just putting it down to, oh, well, I'm just over 40. And so that just I just have to accept that. But actually not, again, not realizing that there could be a bigger problem going on. When was the last time they went for an eye test? You know, even if they'd been for an eye test, was there certain things that were missed? Was there certain things that were not picked up? So again, people walking around, they might say to you, well, I feel really confident driving in the day. But when it comes to night, I really struggle with the light from the, from the glare of the lights and all of this type of stuff. Or you find that people... They start to change the way that they do things. So they're more confident in the day, but then they're not as confident to go out and about in the night. And again, is it because they're just not a confident person or is it because they're not confident to go out in the night because actually they don't see very well? And is it, and, and also, you know, are they aware of their own condition, their own visual impairment, but they don't want to tell anyone like their line manager or their colleague or their friend because they, they're, they're scared that they're going to lose their job. Okay, so on the screen here, what we've got is um, a simulation of he hemonopia. And hemonopia is common with people that have a brain injury or a stroke or a blow to the head. And it just gives you an idea of how different people may see with different types of conditions. And so if you imagine that someone with a hemonopia, they may need to move their head a lot more. They may need to scan from left to right a lot more. And also they may adopt certain head postures. So they may look more to the left rather or look more to the right. Um, and to the general public or the individual, you know, you may think that that looks a bit odd or a bit unusual, but the question is, you know, they're, why are they adopting these different head postures? That's the, probably the best way that they're seeing. So they're using the, the adopting the different head postures to, to see the screen better or to see something better. Macular degeneration, which we know is generally common with older people, but again, some people, younger people do get macular degeneration. Um, it generally affects the central vision of, of, the, of the eye and people may not be able to see centrally, but they still generally have their peripheral vision at the side, below and above intact. 
And so, for example, people may, when they're looking at you, they may um, struggle to see your face. Um, and that's why it's really important to introduce yourself so that somebody knows who they're speaking to. People may also look at you side on rather than straight ahead. Um, and again, it's not because they're being odd or weird. It's just because actually they're, they're using their best part of their vision to be able to see you. So it's just having that in mind, you know, and also people with macular degeneration have different types. There may be a wet, a wet type and a dry type. Okay, so glaucoma. Um, again, glaucoma, a lot of people won't generally have symptoms with glaucoma. It's sort of a silent, a silent disease in a way. So people, it's where the pressure in the eyes, sometimes the pressures are really high and sometimes they're really low. So if you imagine your eyeball becoming really, really hard and, and the pressure in the eyeballs becoming hard, it puts pressure on the optic nerve at the back of the eye, so it slowly destroys the optic nerve over a period of time. But, but people won't necessarily know that they have glaucoma until they go for an eye test because generally their peripheral vision at the side and below and above will start to, to decrease. And again, that would just become people's normal. They wouldn't, gen if they've not been for an eye test, they're not gonna necessarily know that their vision is starting to encroach from the sides. People can also, once um, people are diagnosed, they can get treatment for glaucoma to keep the pressures not too high, not too low, so that they, the pressures become average. Um, and so again, it's just, um, and if people have glaucoma in the family, again, it's important that people go for a regular eye test. Diabetic eye disease, um, again, co common with people who have diabetes. Basically, at the back of the eye, you have the retina. The retina slowly bleeds, and it will leave scarring. And on the screen here, you can see scarring that it's left. Generally, when, when it's happened, you can't get rid of scarring, but you can have laser to stop the bleeding from happening. And again, it's about if someone has diabetes, making sure they're going for regular eye tests to try and prevent um, diabetic retinopathy as much as possible. Um, trying to keep as healthy as possible and a healthy diet, managing the diabetes correctly, um, will reduce the chances of having this type of disease. Cataracts, which I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of. Um, cataracts is generally um, when the eye is aging and getting older effectively, and it's had a lot of exposure to sunlight and all this type of thing because people didn't wear sunglasses. People would describe uh, cataracts as looking through a foggy or misty window. And a lot of people can generally get an operation to remove a cataract. But again, in that process, whilst they're waiting to have that cataract removed, if they, if they are able to, then they're still going to have difficulties with work and computer use and all of this type of stuff. So a workplace assessment is still generally useful for these people, even though they can potentially get their cataract removed because they may be on a waiting list for six months to 12 months to two years. Retinitis pigmentosa, um, again, an, a hereditary condition, basically, which will start in the peripheral vision at the side, below and above, and it will slowly come in, as effectively like looking for a loo roll, um, and that loo roll slowly getting smaller and smaller and smaller over a period of time. Um, and again, people may not realize that they have this condition because it becomes their normal, and, it, and over a period of time, it's getting smaller and smaller, the field of vision, but again, people may not notice. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is a few images um, of the built environment that we live in today. And the built environment that we live in today in the 21st century can enable people with visual impairment or it can disable people with visual impairment. So if we take a look at this train station here, we have a yellow line on, on the platform and that could enable somebody with sight loss to actually navigate around and make sure that they don't fall off the platform. You've also got um, a display board at the top. Um, and again, for somebody that has struggles with distance, they may not be able to see that board really high up on the screen. But if we put that screen at eye level and moved it at eye level on the wall, then maybe they could go up to the screen, get closer and see the time of the train. And at that point, that person wouldn't be disabled, they would be enabled. So that just shows you how the environment that we live in can enable or disable people. Also, the lighting in this, this train station is inconsistent. So the light that some are patchy, so light and then dark and then light. And again, for people with visual impairment, it's better to have consistent lighting rather than sort of dark light, dark light. Um, at the edge of the platform, there isn't any tactile paving. So the bumpy paving that you see at the edge. Um, and again, that's really useful for people that have visual impairment so that they know they're at the edge of, some, of something, in, especially in a train station. Obviously, you don't want to fall off. Um, so here you've got a high street um, and again you look at this image and you sort of think for someone that has a visual impairment how easy is that to navigate so if you look at the lines on the floor some people will think that they can follow those lines but if they follow the line it's actually going to take them into a wall which isn't really useful 
Um, also, you've got bollards on the, on the floor, which are at knee, knee height. And because they're at knee height, it's obviously that somebody may trip over them or fall over them. So again, the solution is to just raise up the, the bollards to make it slightly higher. And with the lines on the floor, the solution again would be to remove the lines so that people don't think that they can follow the lines. And that just shows you how, again, something can enable or disable somebody. Um, these stairs are actually in eye clinic, which is quite ironic. So again, you can see the problems for yourself. Um, someone going down the steps may struggle walking down those steps because they're going from dark to light. Again, they may have to stop halfway up the steps, wait for their eyes to adjust. There's no white lines on the steps to actually highlight the steps for people. Um, but the good news is if the person does fall down the stairs, there's a bed at the bottom. <laughs> and also, um, uh, so that, that's good. And they're in a hospital as well. So, and that, the handrails on the side are quite useful so that, you know, they're color contrasted from the wall. Um, and then this image here on the right one, you can see that it's got very good color contrast on the steps. You've also got the tactile bumpy paving at the bottom and the top to tell the person that you're at the bottom of the top. And then on the left, that may look like a ramp. Some people have a visual impairment and they may struggle and they may think that it's a slide and get confused. So again, it's really important to try and get rid of patterns on, on stairs and just have, we would subscribe to the one on the right really just to make it easier. Um, on this one here, you can see signage. Um, again, the sign you may think is really good on the left, but actually now the person is thinking, well, which toilet do I go into? And for some people, you may think that's just a trivial thing, you know, going into um, the wrong toilet. But for someone that's just acquired sight loss, to go into the wrong toilet, you know, they get odd looks from men or odd looks from women and thinking, why are they in the, the wrong toilet? And people don't necessarily think because they can't see very well. <laughs> And so it's com people could lose their confidence if they get laughed at or, you know, people are rude to them or that type of thing. So again, the solution for this would be to put the, an arrow on the body or on the head so that people know which door to go in. The good thing with this sign is it's good, good color contrast. Um, but again, is the size, would you say the size is maybe too big or too small? Um, obviously, it's very difficult for some people that have no peripheral vision. They may only see a part of the body from, they may only see from the dress upwards. Um, so they may still not know. So again, maybe slightly smaller sign, but the color contrast is very, very good. And so bigger is not always better when it comes to sight loss. Um, so on the right side, again, you've got um, the signs are quite difficult to see. They look quite similar. And again, people may walk into the wrong toilet. You've also got patterns on the floor. And for some people, again, with lots of patterns on the floor, it may be difficult for them to navigate. Okay, so how many people in the UK have a visual impairment? So there's currently 2 million people in the UK that have a visual impairment, and that's currently going to increase to about 4 million by 2050. Um, and that's going to be due to an aging population, diabetes, um, and obesity. So, you know, it's going to double. So we have a, we're going to have a lot more people with visual impairment. So we need to make sure that our services are inclusive and also that we're delivering high quality services to those people that do struggle in the workplace with their vision. And also that we're promoting eye health prevention messages within the workplace to make sure that we um, catch things early because we know that prevention is better than cure. What percentage of people that are registered blind have no vision at all? And we know that's about 5% of people. So again, um, if people have the perception that people who are blind can't see anything at all. So when you see somebody with a guide dog or a cane, um, you may think that they can't see anything at all, but most people can, okay? Um, and it's quite funny because I also have a guide dog myself. Um, and when I'm walking around, people will come up to me and I'll stroke the dog really and they'll come up really quietly and I'll stroke, give the dog a little sneaky stroke and then they'll walk off really quietly as if to say, as if I couldn't see them at all. And I call them the sneaky strokers of society because um, people think that you can't see anything at all, but I could see them. And then when I tell them that I, could, I saw you there, you sneaky stroker, they get a bit freaked out. <laughs> So what percentage of the UK population don't even bother going for an eye test? It's 28% of the UK population don't even bother. So that means that those people that don't even bother going for an eye test potentially could have something wrong with their vision, but no one's ever picked it up because they've assumed that they're clumsy or they've assumed that they just get headaches. Um, and also the scary thing is, is that those people are also potentially having driving on the roads today. And the other question to pose really is, how many people do you think have crashes, car crashes, due to their vision um, and how many people, and do they actually get tested? You know, so when people are having car crashes, is vision ever a question of, of why they had the car crash in the first place? 
And I think it's not really, it's not really considered. People don't really think too much about vision. Um, and it's something that we sh definitely should be talking about and it should definitely be on the agenda, especially as it's the year of 2020, which is 2020 vision. And it's important that we have this message. So only about 5% of people um, currently in the UK use Braille. And the reason for that really is technology. So for example, if I just um, give you an example, when, I'm, when I use a mobile phone and I want to read an email, this is how I would read an email. Okay, so that's how I would read an email and that's just on my iPhone. I've got, um, uh, it's got software built into it. And so, Again, technology is leading the way so that people can actually access um, speech on their computer or magnification on their computer and that type of thing. But again, it's important that people have that assessment to know what's available to them to, to empower them to do their job effectively. I suppose it's like back in the day when people used to use typewriters and now everybody uses computers. It's the same type of um, principle. But people, there is still a place for Braille for people and still people will still use it. Okay, so there's 72% of the working age population of people with a visual impairment are unemployed in the UK. And in my mind, that's a sad state of affairs because simple things that people can do to make the slight adjustments actually make a huge difference to people with visual impairment. And why wouldn't you want someone in your workforce that can read an email quicker than someone that can see, as I just demonstrated to you there? So 50% of sight loss is avoidable. And the main reason it's avoidable is because of things such as, you know, not wearing contact lenses in swimming pools, um, wearing sunglasses, all of the stuff that we spoke about earlier, but also going for a regular eye test. So every two years, you should go for a regular eye test. Um, and if you use, if you do um, v, VDU use for more than four hours um, a day, then you actually, your employer is entitled to give you free eye tests as well. And a lot of people, again, are not aware of that because the employers don't all promote that. So it's important that um, you, you push that message out there. And also, if you have someone that has a, a condition in the family, such as glaucoma or macular degeneration, then also you, you should be going um, more, more regularly. So yearly, or if, you, or if you have diabetes yourself, then again, go yearly so that you catch things early. So 250 people in the UK will start to lose their sight every day. So they'll be the people that are experiencing these problems, which I said earlier. So headaches, clumsiness, um, tripping over a lot. And, and that will be early signs of their sight loss. And again, it's are they picking up on that? So, so it's quite a lot of people that are starting to lose their sight every day, you know. But sometimes it doesn't get spotted until the vision has become very, very bad. And, and people start to think, I need to go for an eye test. So 43% of people that have a visual impairment will also experience depression. Um, so again, you know, mental health and visual impairment are very interlinked. And again, that's why it's really important that when people experience sight loss that they get the social emotional support as well. So it's all well and good putting in lots of equipment in the workplace, which is great, but they still need the social emotional well-being support as well. So I would generally look at referring people on to counseling or to local sight loss charities to, to meet other people with sight loss for peer support so they don't feel like they're the only one, you know, because I think that's also very, very important um, to also refer them for rehabilitation so they know how to use a cane and, and how to be more independent in the home. Really, really key things that need to be addressed as someone's sight loss journey. It's not all just about equipment. Um, solutions. It's, a, it's about bigger picture stuff for people with sight loss to actually, um, if they're not happy in their job then they're, and, and they're not happy at home, then they're not going to be happy, you know, altogether. So what jobs do blind people do, you may think? So historically, blind people used to do basket weeding, and I think we've come on a, a long way from that now. But in the UK, currently, we have barristers, lawyers, um, admin staff, managers, singers, um, bankers, all types of jobs, really. So the only jobs that a blind person really couldn't do is, is be, become a pilot or um, a police officer or generally jobs where, where, which will include lots of uh, driving and that type of thing. But, you know, most jobs people can do. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to read, uh, my colleague Jill is just going to read out a case study and we're just going to unpick this case study. Okay, John has retinitis pigmentosa. He has severe neck, shoulder, and back pain. His employer organized an ergonomic workplace assessment. 
what adjustments do you think were recommended? Okay, so I just want you to think about that. So John has, um, has severe back pain and neck pain, okay? Why do you think that is? So what generally happens is people with this, so he's got retinitis pigmentosa, which means that his vision at the side is, is reduced. He can't see at the side or below or above. And he's got the neck pain basically because he's moving his head from side to side, left to right, all the time scanning the screen. Um, and he's not really seeing the screen properly. So what was recommended was... An ergonomic workplace assessment was arranged. Um, the ergonomic assessment cost £800. There was a 34-inch large screen, which cost £500, etc. £500, foot dress £50, and a sit and stand length £1,000, totaling £2,850. Okay, so John, he had a workplace assessment, which was um, an ergonomic specialist. He actually got a larger screen, which in this situation wouldn't have actually been useful because that's going to exacerbate the, the neck movements. Now he's going to move his neck a lot wider, left to right, left to right. Um, his, his back problems probably got worse by doing that because he's moving his head and moving his neck a lot more. Actually, the problem was that he couldn't see very well. The person that did the assessment was more focused on the physical problem rather than the vision and if we had sorted out the vision then actually the physical problem would have improved so what he should have had is magnification software an ergonomic arm to bring the screen closer to the face a slightly smaller screen potentially larger print keyboard um, contrasting on the screen to make the screen um, easier to see also dimming the lighting in the office to make it easier for him to be able to see and some of that stuff there was effectively a waste of money because actually if we sorted out the vision side of things then actually these these other things wouldn't have necessarily been necessary and that just sort of demonstrates and that's a common situation that i see when i go into workplaces that people think that because someone can't see very well that they'll just buy a massive screen and everything will be fine but actually sometimes that can be a lot worse and and not solve the problem and also then not all of the emotional and the social situation has been sorted out it's not just about the equipment it's about has that person been referred to counseling have they been referred to a local charity for help and support for their for their home life because actually you know it's like i said it's bigger picture for them okay so what adjustments here we've got are zoom text which can magnify the screen which we spoke about a larger keyboard or a larger screen um, a CCTV on so that they can magnify so they can put paper under the under the screen and it will use a camera and the, um, so all of the documents paper documents they can blow up and make bigger um, up to 50 times bigger people can also get iPads and iPhones which will also magnify the screen this type of thing um, and they can also get specialist devices which can enlarge and make things bigger for them and change the color and the contrast and maybe an ergonomic arm so that they can bring the screen closer to their face. So that if you bring the screen closer to the face, you get bigger magnification because you're bringing the object closer to the uh, vision. There's lots of things that can, you, um, employers can do which for people that have visual impairment, which, and, which don't even cost anything at all, do they? Keeping an object in a regular place, you know, making sure that things are not in people's way so that they can't trip over or fall over things. Providing information in alternative formats. So rather than sending out letters all the time in small print, you know, think about larger print or emails or text, um, you know, just thinking about or audio formats. So just thinking about your formats. And that's not just for your employees, but your colleagues um, or your customers as well. Thinking about color contrast. So like I said, if you put a light gray and a dark gray together, that may just blend in as one block of gray. So changing um, having a, a very different color contrast so black on white or white on black that type of thing fixed location desk so that the person with a visual impairment knows that they're always in that spot all the time rather than trying to locate a different desk all the time can be quite challenging and also quite stressful to find that desk all the time and also they know they've got all their equipment set up on that desk um, they know where it is they know how to get from there to the toilet and from the toilet to the cafe and that type of thing so it helps with navigation orientation around the office as well giving somebody additional breaks because they may need to administer their medication um, their eye drops uh, in a sterile environment and they may need to rest their eyes as well because of the glare from the from this from the office 
Um, people mean, may need flexible working hours. So they may have night blindness, meaning they struggle more in the night than they do in the day. So it's better if they come in early and then leave early um, before it gets dark, you know? So it's about appreciating that. Um, and some people may home, need to work from home because they can manage the lighting conditions um, for their condition. Okay, we'll just talk a bit about guide dogs. So what, what do we know about guide dogs? They come in many different shapes and sizes. Um, and generally they're Labradors, Golden Retrievers or German Shepherds. Um, it costs about £50,000 a year, uh, sorry, £50,000 for the lifetime of a guide dog. So that's from birth to death. Guide dogs um, literally will guide somebody around obstacles so that people don't walk into the obstacle. When you're walking, the guide dog will, will go to the curb and you say, find the curb and the guide dog will find the curb. And then you have to decide whether it's safe to cross the road or not. A lot of people think the dog knows when to cross the road, but the owner needs to know when to cross the road. So they do that by using the remaining vision they have or asking a member of the public or listening to the, the, the beep on the pedestrian crossing. Guide dogs will also find steps. So if you say find a step, the dog will find a step um, and you put the first paw on the step and then the owner will then say um, forward, okay? Um, so they are very, very intelligent dogs um, and they will just guide people around obstacles, go to the curb, sit at the curb, and then the owner will decide when, it, when it's safe to cross the road. Um, and the guide dog will also wear the harness, which tells the public that it's a guide dog. Um, when, the, when the dog wears a harness, it knows it's working. Like when you go to work and wear a uniform, the dog knows it's wearing a uniform when it goes to work um, and it will, it will act in work mode. And when the harness comes off, the dog acts in play mode. Um, and so it's really important to ask the owner if it's okay to stroke the dog when it's in work. So never assume that it's okay. Always ask if it's okay. And there's a time and a place like everything. Obviously, there's, when you're trying to cross a road, you don't really want someone stroking your dog. So just ask the owner. And never afraid to ask somebody if they need some help. Um, if you don't ask, then you don't know. So it's really important just to ask somebody, would you like some assistance? And they can say yes or no. Or they can say something else. And that's just a rude person, not because they're blind. We get rude people in all walks of life. So canes, you may see a lot of people that use a, a long white cane um, and that people will use it, move it from left to right. And basically when they're navigating along, they're going to hit obstacles um, if they're in their way or, or, or pe tell people that they have a visual impairment and they can't see very well. So please, could you just uh, mind, mind out the way? And also people will have a red and white striped cane. And basically that means that somebody has a hearing impairment and a visual impairment. Um, and some people may also use a red, yellow, green or blue cane. And that just means they can't see very well, but they also wanted a color cane because they're quite fashionable. Um, and they wanted the, maybe the pink one to match the shoes or the blue one to match the coat or that type of thing. So the, the colored canes is a craze that come over from Canada because it was more children were more interested by using colored canes than they would be using um, a white cane because they stigmatize white with older people. So it was just, um, but it just means that someone can't see very well if you see that, okay? And when you see the red and white ones that have got the stripes on, that just means that someone can't hear very well or see very well, and it's just to, to be mindful, but not necessarily completely deaf or completely blind. Um, and again, within our assessments, we make sure that we refer people out to the correct organizations that can provide this type of um, training for them. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, like I said, my contact details are here. Um, if you need to contact me for anything, I'm more than happy. Um, I provide visual impairment awareness training for organizations and also workplace assessments for any employees that ha you have with visual impairments or anyone that's struggling with their, their workplace. I'll come out, do an assessment. Uh, it will take about two to three hours. We'll look at their workstation. They're set up in the, in the workstation currently. What adjustment needs to be put in place? We'll then write a report for the employer um, and make recommendations for solutions, not just in the workplace, but also at home as well. Okay, so we open up the floor to questions, Neil. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, that was really, really informative. We have got some questions um, in the uh, room. Uh, Amanda is telling us about a personal experience uh, of optic neuritis and she lost vision in one eye, which made uh, everything extremely difficult um, until she in, uh, adjusted enough. Uh, luckily it started to resolve, uh, to resolve and after a couple of weeks, um, but vision in that eye is still a bit odd. So uh, that's an observation from Amanda. Thank you for sharing that, Amanda. Um, Thank you. 
how how do you mean odd can you can you um quantify it can you qualify it at all is it is it still slightly blurred or can you hear me yes, yeah and thank you yeah it's it's it, it's a strange one it's not it's almost like patches are not quite focused so, so i'll do my acuity my visual acuity is absolutely fine apart from short-sighted but my it's not exactly focused but if I try and look it's like if I try and look through certain bits of my eye it's not quite right and is that linked to some type of autoimmune disease or don't know it's just class it's just been classed as a as a, a one-off event ah right okay so yeah but yeah it was, it was a weird one it, it was um it was my op luckily I've got a very good optician mm-hmm um, and I'd started it, I, I thought at first it was sinusitis, I'd got like headachey sinus areas. And then I noticed that it was almost like, um, it was almost like trying to look through a pair of glasses when they're not clean. Mm -hmm. But even when I didn't have my glasses on, I thought, well, that's a bit odd. And I was watching telly and I suddenly realised that the colour had changed. I wasn't, wasn't seeing colour through my eye properly. So I started playing one eye against the other and the colour was different and I'd actually... I've actually developed um, colour deficit as well in that one eye. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that when when you look through both eyes, sometimes if you're having a vision problem, try and shut one eye and then it, it will make the, the problem sort of a lot more easier to see because some people, when they're looking through both eyes, they don't necessarily know any different because that becomes their normal as well. So it's just another point to sort of make everyone aware of as well, really. <laughs> Yeah, but I think it's useful to know, and I don't know whether it happens in other areas, but the, my optician was actually part of a um, a trial for direct referral to the ophthalmology at the hospital. Yeah. So and I, I went directly from the optician. It was brilliant. Yeah, that's another point as well. A lot of people seem to present sometimes at the GP, um, and GPs sometimes only get a couple of weeks training on ophthalmology, and... Um, and then they send people home. And I've heard horrific stories where people have gone blind overnight because they've gone to the GP. The GP sent them home with conjunctivitis. And actually, it's something a lot more serious. So I would, what I would say to everyone as well is if you get an eye problem, don't bother with the GP. Go straight to the optician or the eye casualty. And also, sometimes if you rock up at A&E and you, you don't get seen by a consultant ophthalmologist and you're seen by a junior registrar, Again, I've heard horrific stories where things have not been picked up from junior doctors as well. So just to be aware of that type of thing as well. Because what I hadn't, what I also hadn't realised, if it's an emergency appointment at your opticians, mm -hmm. it's not chargeable. Yeah, yeah. It's free and I don't think people realise that. No, definitely. Yeah, and I think they, they, the profession need to do a lot more um, awareness on that because that is a really good point. Wonderful. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Amanda. That's great. Right, so um, Janet's asked, uh, do web developers do a good job of making their sites accessible and is alt text for images useful? Okay, so alt text um, is basically abbreviated to alternative text. And so um, if, if you're using a screen reader um, and the screen reader sees an image, it will just say image image, image, unless there's alternative text on that image to tell you what that picture is. Um, so yeah, it's really important that pictures are labeled um, and you can do that by right, when you're creating a document by right clicking on the picture and just say add alternative text. And you can also do that on Facebook and Twitter and all that type of thing as well. They've all sort of started to incorporate that into um, the development. And yeah, it is really important because otherwise you don't know what picture um, you're looking at do people do it? So with public sector websites, there was new legislation passed in September last year that come into force in September last year, which said that all public sector websites have to be accessible by law. Um, and it is illegal to not have a public sector website that isn't accessible. Um, so and so that includes sort of um, universities to councils, etc. And um, so all websites must be accessible. Um, other, uh, but, but in reality, not every website is accessible. So it, and it generally comes down to how aware is the IT directors in the company of accessibility and how much of a priority is it for, for them. And generally until people sort of with visual impairment complain about a website, that's generally when something actually changes or gets done. 
but yeah from the person with the visual impairments perspective it is really important yeah that's uh, certainly something that I can add a little bit to at the university we use a system um, on our course resources that are uh, student facing called ally um, and ally gives us a score at the university anything below 85 percent is not acceptable um, and uh, the software uh, actually runs through everything on the page and tells us exactly where we can improve our ally score. Um, and that will include uh, such things as um, uh, alt text. So if you've got a, a picture that hasn't got any alt te text in it, um, it will highlight it. And obviously you can, you can then go back and, and, and recreate it. So from an accessibility mm -hmm. po point of view, um, in terms of the Office of Students, um, uh, which is a, a national body, um, that's extremely important. Accessibility is everything at the university. Um, equality of opportunity is uh, really important in the public sector. So um, uh, there's, there's great strides that are being made um, to, yeah. to uh, education, I mean, particularly was, inclusive. There was some case law as well recently where um, an indiv a blind um, individual in America took Domino's pizza to court around not their website wasn't accessible because she couldn't order a pizza um on the website and actually she won the case and they were ordered to pay compensation but also to make their website accessible so you know people do <coughs> take legal action against these type of things as well right so the next question comes again from amanda um she's asking what would you advise for factory workers where safety is critical who do not have transferable skills when their vision deteriorates to such a degree that they cannot undertake their job safely yeah, and I think that's an interesting one because I've come up across that a few times. Um, so obviously we know the legislation and we know the Equality Act and we know that employers have a duty to make reasonable adjustments and obviously reasonable is that for the judge ultimately to decide. Um, so what you, you, you've got to do whatever is in your power to do that's reasonable. Um, health and safety is used a lot to not want to do reasonable adjustment I would say in my experience um, but there must be something that that factory worker could do and it may be reasonable that we as an employer train that individual in some level of different skill so it might be put him on an IT course or her on an IT course for a couple of months to skill up on IT and maybe work in admin in the call center or switchboard or doing orders etc or it might be that the one one of the part of the factory that they're working in isn't appropriate, but the other part of the factory is appropriate. So what I would say, first of all, is explore every opportunity that is possible. Um, and if it really, really isn't possible, then obviously you're looking at medical retirement and redundancy and that type of thing. But then, you know, you are leaving yourself liable to be sued under disability discrimination as well. So it's sort of weighing up but you, you've got to be seen to be putting in things. I, I've seen situations like that where they go, no, we can't do that because of health and safety. And then they've not tried to do anything else before we get to that point. So for me, it's about try to do reasonable adjustment. If that doesn't work, then at that point, yeah, you could look at that, but you've got to try first. And, okay. and, also, and also it's subjective that someone's vision is not good enough to do the job because that's your opinion that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not capable of doing the job they may still be able to do it they may just have to take extra precautions um so i would say it's very variable yeah absolutely right so coralie's asked um where is the best place for us to locate any local charities that would be able to help with vision loss is there a register of local charities um yeah so there is a register of local charities so it's called sightline directory um and and basically you type in your uh, patient postcode and it will bring up all of the local services to that individual um but they are doing so they don't do loads on employment but what they do do is things such as um, peer support so maybe running groups where people can meet individuals with sight loss um they might run a social group or a running group or something like that so for the emotional social stuff definitely the local charities um can be useful and maybe some benefits advice and that type of thing right uh, and so also and also volunteer and fundraise for your local you know your local organizations good thank you 
So Jane has asked, do you advise workplaces following injury or accidents, especially with regards to eggshell issues when total loss in one eye? Um, not, I'm not sure what eggshell issues are, to be honest. No, I, I'm not sure. Jane, do you want to put your microphone on? I, yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, I've, I've in the past dealt with a case where they lost um, an eye totally. Um, and because they were working in manufacturing, um, I think the law states about um, eggshell, you've got to treat that other eye um, extra careful. Um, and anything that could happen to the, 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 the eye that they can, they can see through, um, as an employer, you have to be extra vigilant um, yeah. with regards to that. Um, and I do get all about the disability and about yeah. moving people because, but ultimately, if you're in a, a factory environment yeah. where, um, you know, the, there is, you know, safety hazards there, yeah. um, you know, it, it, it is really, really difficult. Um, and, yeah. you know, the experience I had was that the, the manager didn't understand that, you know, the, the danger of losing that other eye regardless of what if it happened at work they were um you know i think it, it is called the eggshell okay um so I've, yeah so i i don't do i've not done that but i probably could point you in the right direction mm. of someone that can have so yeah in terms of um keeping people in work and employee retention i do employee mm. retention workplace assessments and income protection um in it, it, but i can generally find someone that can if if, if it's around vision so yeah mm. Yes, okay. Okay. I would imagine on that as well, you would have to adapt um, your risk assessment um, scoring criteria mm -hmm. in order to make it more likely um, to be catastrophic, yeah. um, you know, if something were to happen. So it may well be a slightly differently weighted um, risk assessment that, you know, a health and safety team um, might might do with uh, advice from um, uh, people such as Dan yeah. in terms of you know ways in which they can uh, uh, can uh, I suppose um, put in additional protective measures um, yeah. and somebody that that has sight loss um, mm. and um, you know would would be ideally placed to do that so 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 that's that's mm -hmm. really useful thank I, you i i have i have also met a lot of people with visual impairment that have been you know sort of signed off by gps or rock health and and you know <laughs> been told that they can medically retire or they they're unable to work but if that was to come into a court of law and and a judge called me to say give evidence and tell me what adjustments you sh should have been put in place. I don't think some of these people should have been medically retired. No. And I could tell a judge that, you know, hands down mm. and, and, and they probably could do their job fine. Mm. So I do think there is a, a massive issue with people being medically retired when they don't necessarily need to be. Mm. And, yeah. and, and then I meet them afterwards and they're, they're an emotional wreck and they've got They've, you know, and some I've met, I know some one lady that's just at home all the time now. It's it's just horrific how it's impacted on her life and her mental health. And she's literally suicidal now because someone's taken told her that she can no longer work. But I would I would have said she was capable of working. So th there is a lot of issues around that as well at the moment that I've seen. Yeah, it's it's using the transferable skills and also Definitely. like you said before about developing other ones. I mean, what we looked yeah. at with this particular gentleman. Um, he went into more of a supervisory role. Yeah. So he, he had, but he, he couldn't work on the actual shop floor as it was because of, yeah. of the industry itself. Um, but That's yeah, we, we, we did fight um, quite hard about this with the, and you know, listening to yourself, I thought, yeah. you know, I'm not saying it would have been easy, but I think yeah. it would have been easier uh, yeah. having somebody like yourself coming yeah, and, and discuss this but and, uh, and no, i think you. also aware and and one of the things i always push as well is awareness of the uh, visual impairment awareness training for the colleagues and the managers mm -hmm. to, to just get it a bit more because sometimes yeah. they're you know they're freaking out and they're not really sure and da 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 yeah. and so that is quite important as well so i do a lot of awareness training with sort of um colleagues and and line managers and i think the other sort of um thing to touch upon as well is the whole um 
you know the mental health that comes with mm. with visual impairment and um people not knowing where to turn and 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 training you know so it's like all of a sudden you become blind you now need to know how to how to use a computer you know you with magnification software how do you um use a computer with with speech software so you've got to learn all of these skills um and i'm 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 a massive advocate for promoting uh, blind people to be managers and directors mm -hmm. because the best the people at the top can delegate so mm -hmm. if you struggle you delegate it to someone else you know mm -hmm. um and yeah, I mean, I, I run my own business, but I love to delegate, you know, so, but that's, but you use the skills that you do have and, and everyone's got some type of skill um, to, to utilize in some, some way. Mm -hmm. And, and it might be that, you know, that they need to look for an alternative job and maybe helping them to look for an alternative job or, or skill really. And I think yeah. it's something like an injury or an accident, it's yeah. an immediate thing. Yeah. And to, to actually adjust to that is really difficult. You know, yeah. the, the whole mental uh, health is affected. But yeah. you know, to try and adjust to just having one line of vision is is incredibly difficult. Yeah, and and I think just to add to that is that you know, whilst um, an employer, so you may get individuals that yes, all the adjustments that you put in place are never going to work, and so mm. that's you know, in, I've done probably about five hundred assessments now, and I don't know if it, I've not had. Well, I think I've had about one of them, but. But um, most of the time, people, you know, can do something. But but what I would say is that it's also about looking at the package that the individuals get in. So once once they're medically retired, yes, they'll probably get a lump sum of money. But do they then get the emotional? Do they get counselling? Do they get benefits advice? Do they get rehabilitation to get on with their life at home so that they can actually get from from home to the local shop? Um, are we convincing the employers that they need to pay for all of that as well privately rather than make them go through the bureaucracy of a local authority and wait a year or two years for rehabilitation so i think it's it's also weighing up the whole package of support that that individual gets whether they stay in work or they are retired from work Thank you. okay so um we've got um i think it's an observation from dawn um who tells us that um, her father in uh, her father is uh, in Blind Veterans UK, and they've been amazing in providing lots of equipment for him to enable. Um, it isn't for work, but maybe a useful resource for someone to bear in mind. Now, as far as I'm aware, I've heard of this charity before, and they do also offer um, blind veteran um, uh, that are of working age um, support and uh, equipment. Yeah, they do. Uh, the, it, yeah, yeah he, my dad's eighty something, but he went blind later in life. But um, they've been brilliant. But they do offer it to a whole range yeah. of ex-service people, even like you know twenties, thirties. Yeah. It's just in case anyone is an extra resource. But um, yeah. even the site service in the community that he lives in Gate said, but they've been brilliant and they do come out regularly and just you know keep an eye on them. Well, uh, sorry I didn't mean to keep an eye on him but you know what I mean yeah. and they just monitor his progress I didn't mean uh -huh. to say that yeah. um, and they've you know they've installed things in his house and you know really enabled him so he's had really good support so it's, it, it is out there I think it's just being able to get it isn't it yeah, yeah. yeah definitely and I think Blind Veterans UK is, is a really good charity for veterans and they are very well funded and, and resourced and generally whatever an individual wants they or needs they will generally get so they are really really useful to know mm. yeah if you're veterans and that's not just veterans um in like you know combat it's also um police services as well and all the blue light services that yeah. also includes them as well right and then the last question dan um uh, which i think is one that we can answer fairly easily it says you mention eye testing if using a screen for more than four hours a day is this mandatory for an employer to provide that? And the overriding answer is yes. I think that's with the HSE regulations of the EU. Regulations, yeah. absolutely. Um, and obviously, anybody that's classified as a user um, is entitled to have a, a free eyesight test. Some employers will um, try and do vision screening. Um, and try and get away with that. But the law actually states that it is a, a full vision uh, screen with uh, a qualified optometrist or optician. So um, even if an employer tells you that you're entitled to have vision screening, you can, uh, by law, request to have uh, a full sight test. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things that a lot of employers don't seem to um, promote very well. 
Um, and I'm always pushing to say, you know, get employers to promote it because we know that 50% of site loss is avoidable. Um, so why are we not promoting it? We know that also out, ophthalmology outpatients is the biggest outpatients department in the country. So and they've got a massive backlog now, you know, lots of people having eye injuries on the back of all of this. So it's, it's going to be an interesting conundrum of what, what happens in the near future. Um, but yeah, one of the things is I'm, you know, not mental health was really important and we're great at doing mental health awareness days and this type of thing, but why are we not doing eye health? promotion days and also have you ever wondered how many crashes are happening in this country through people not seeing well you know we say oh we probably know about people drink driving we know about people taking drugs and driving but we don't necessarily know about people that can't see that are driving and they they crash as a result i mean um what shocks me is that taxi drivers are having eye tests by um well oc health oc health are doing eye tests for taxi drivers and hgv drivers which is great, but you're looking at a Snellen chart from from 25 meters away or a, or a six meters away, but that doesn't mean that you're you can't see at the side or you can't see in the night. So it doesn't really tell you much unless you do a full vision test in an op, in an optician. So it's quite scary, really. Absolutely, um, and as um, M has said, that it's, it is really important to differentiate between eye screening or yeah. vision screening and eye examination. Definitely. Um, so, so yeah, that's all the questions. There's been lots of thank yous and um, praise for the information that you've um, uh, given us, Dan. So, um, uh, on behalf of IOH, uh, mm -hmm. the Association of Occupational Health and Wellbeing Professionals, I'd like to thank you um, for your time this evening. Um, and um, if there's no further questions, I think we mm -hmm. want to uh, go and enjoy the rest of our evening. That's great. Thank you very much. Pleasure. And if anyone wants to contact me, then my contact details um, are on the screen. OK, wonderful. Uh, what I'll also do, Dan, uh, when yeah. we put it up on to um, the YouTube channel, um, I can also put your uh, website underneath as well so we can, okay. uh, great. We can uh, publish, uh, publicise that for you. That's great. Thank you very much. All right, Dan. Thank you very yeah, much. Indeed, thanks. thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 For a little Bye. bit of a, a social, uh, we will be uh, doing that um, 